Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, that we can really speak with you as a child to his father or her father. Thank you, Lord, that we can ask you to take your word and open it up for us today. Thank you, Lord, that we can ask you to help us to see how we should apply your truths in our lives and order our lives according to your will. As obviously some of the elders or the leaders in that Ephesian church where Timothy found himself um, did not do. And it caused a bit of chaos in that church. And it will do so, not just in church, but in our lives as well. I pray, Father, that you will help us to look at our lives honestly. O oh, Holy Spirit, that you will convict us of the truths and the, the order that we find in, in your word. And that we will overlay it on our hearts, first of all, so that we will have the desire to align our lives out of joy, out of love, because of the indwelling of you, O Holy Spirit, according to God's ways. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Timothy 3, and we are going to read from verse 1. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So far, the reading of God's word. For as long as there have, have been households, there have been rules to direct household life. And I guess if I would ask each family here, what are the special rules in your house? You will cover the basics, but there will also be some rules that are unique to your household. Do you remember the words, or maybe you said it to your children, as long as you, as you live in this house, you follow my rules? I still do that with my kids and their adults. <laughs> well, naturally, the head of the household and, and his beautiful, suitable helper alongside him put together these rules, decide on the re these rules, and have the privilege of establishing these rules. No, but why do we have them? Well, simply to provide the household with order, with purpose, direction, it makes the gears of the family engine run smoothly. <coughs> Paul refers to the local church as God's household. He does that in chapter 3 verse 15. 1 Timothy 3 15. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. It was particularly with the ideas of responsibility and order in mind that Paul drew on the household analogy to describe church life for Timothy. And believe me, there was an issue with order in the church of Ephesus. The church suffered from things like infighting, envy, Strife, malicious talk, friction, evil suspicions. You can read of that in those first few verses of chapter 6 of this letter. And it seems like they've also fallen for the, the gender zeitgeist. 
spirit of the times, by allowing women to teach and assume authority in God's household. But as Paul pointed out there in chapter 2 from verse 11 to 15, that was not the order God had established in his first household. Where was that? In the Garden of Eden. Adam was made first. And he was therefore the, the representative of his household. And before God made Eve, he gave him his laws. And he told him what to do in the Garden of Eden to tend him. So Adam had to oversee that God's will be done, oversee that God's garden is tended. He was the first overseer. And then Paul points out in verse 14, just looked at what happened when Adam took the lead, uh, Eve took the lead, when, when this order was turned on his head. It is as if Paul is saying to, to Timothy here, yeah. so Timothy, my brother, my son in the faith, Follow God's order for God's household. God's appointed overseers should lead and teach the members of his household. But who should they be? Shall we put an ad in the newspaper with certain qualifications that has to be met? What should we look for in a person we appoint as an overseer in God's local household? Now this is one of the most challenging services, uh, sermons for me, because I'm preaching for myself. Whatever I'm going to tell you today, this is the standard that I have to hold myself to and that you have to hold me to. The first and most important qualification to look for in a pastor or an elder or an overseer, and we will look at these three terms a bit later on, is a spiritual qualification. It is alluded to in verse 1 of chapter 3. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Then Paul gives a, a list of things. Now we're not going to look at all of them. Um, we are going, only going to look at the first grouping of these qualifications, which I would call the moral qualifications later on. That's from verse 2 and onwards. But the first thing that we need to establish is this. There need to be a spiritual qualification for a pastor to function as a pastor in the church. Paul starts out with the second. It's a trustworthy saying. In other words, this is true. This also indicates that there's no major shift in the topic Paul was addressing. The topic continues to be proper conduct in God's household. But fittingly, Paul begins with the leadership of God's household. Now we know so far from chapter 2, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, that these should not be women. That would, that would turn God's order upside down. We know it should be men, therefore. But what, but what men? What kind of men are you going to put in the overseeing position of a local church? What kind of men would you gladly follow and listen to and submit to in terms of leadership? You as a local church. Whose guidance and care and teaching will you submit to and gladly sit under in the local church. What kind of men, man should that be? Let's find out. Paul does not leave us in the dark there. Still in verse 1, we are going to take it slow. Word by word. He, word, word by word. He begins with the word whoever. Okay, now that, that sounds like it's a wide open appeal for any candidate to step forward and, uh, and fill this position in the church. Whoever. But the original Greek restricts it much more. The, we have the word whoever in our um, NIV Bible. In the Greek, it is two words. A tis, meaning if this. If this person, in other words. It is a very specific person. Why is this important to point this out? It means that not everyone 
can or should pursue this function in God's household. Only someone, and then Paul gives us a bit of an indication of what kind of person he has in mind, <clears throat> only someone who aspires to be an overseer. So it's not open to everybody, but to those who aspire to be an overseer. The word aspire in English means from the Greek word to stretch oneself out, to reach for. I've got a lovely fig tree in my garden. It's one of the things in my garden that I'm proud of. Most of the other stuff died. I don't know why. I'm still trying to figure that out. But the, the fig tree is quite tall now, taller than I. Oh, and when I see that lovely big fig with its purple cheeks, there at the top, I stretch out. That's before my mom gets to it. I stretch out and grab it and enjoy the sweetness of that fig. That's the idea here. To stretch out, but it's not a, a general stretch out like you would do in the mornings when you wake up. It is reaching for something very specifically. Stretching out, reaching out to be an overseer in God's household. So what is an overseer? Should you now be, begin to call me overseer marinus? Well, you can if you want to. You will biblically be not correct if you do that. But we prefer the, the term pastor and you'll see why. Let, let's just get an understanding of the word overseer here as well. Now, I want you to turn with me to Acts 20. Acts 20, verse 17. We are going to read two verses there. Verse 17 and verse 28. Paul was addressing the elders of Ephesus, saying goodbye to them on his way to Jerusalem. Now in, in Acts 20 verse 17, you read the word elders. He was addressing the elders there. In verse 28, which I'm going to read with you, we read the following. Keep watch, that's Acts 20 verse 28, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's the word. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So in these two verses, verse 17 and verse 28, we read of elders, we read of overseers and shepherds. But all three words describe the same group of people, the same group of men, the spiritual leaders of that church. So that in the New Testament, we find these three, these three terms used interchangeably for the same function which we would call in our church the pastor. But you can also call it an overseer. You can also call me an elder. And that the same would go for Pastor Kali then. These three words just highlight a, a different side of this function of spiritual leadership in a local church. An overseer, the word oversee um, means oversight to see to it that things are done. It comes from the Greek word, and you might remember, you might recognize this word, episkopos. You have the episcopal church. You've heard of the episcopalians. This is where the word comes from. It means overseer. To put it simply, it is to keep an eye on God's flock, spiritually, to their well-being, even to the practical smooth running of the day-to-day -day functions of the local church, to oversee that things run smoothly on all these levels in God's household. An elder, what is that? What is the, the, the side of this leadership that it highlights? Well, it comes from the Jewish synagogue model. And the Greek word used in the New Testament is also a word that you will Remember, a church is called according to this. The term for an elder is presbyteros. We get the Presbyterian church. That's where that word comes from. And that word presbyteros, elder, signifies seniority and wisdom. Not so much of old age, although it can be used in that sense, but in the context of uh, the local church and leadership, more in terms of wisdom and judging. Moses 
You remember at one stage when he was there in the desert and all the people came complaining to him and he had to judge a whole nation and he just couldn't, he just couldn't get to it all. He appointed judges for two reasons. To judge the children of Israel and to teach them. And you might also remember that every now and then in the Old Testament we read of elders sitting in the gates of a city to judge and to teach. That's what is behind the term elder. There's a teaching function, a wisdom function. He's the person who, make, who makes wise judgments and decisions in the local church for the good of God's people and for the glory of God. But Paul used another word, shepherd, to describe this leadership of the local church in Ephesus. Now, shepherd in Greek, that's the language of of the new, that the New Testament, New Testament was written in, is poimen. Now that might not sound very f- familiar to your ears, but the Latin form of that you will recognize immediately. Pastor. That's where we get the word pastor. The word pastor means, is Latin for shepherd. And it describes the function of tending, taking care of God's flock. A pastor, a shepherd, makes sure that the flock drinks healthy, life-giving water every Sunday morning, that they eat from the eternal bread of life every time they hear a sermon, but the shepherd also attends to those who are sick and struggling in the flock. He will seek out those who have wandered off. He will ward off the bear and the lion of false teaching and make sure that the members of God's household are safe. Pastor, and that's the term that we prefer in our local congregation to to refer to this spiritual leadership in the local church. Pastor, but when you read of an elder in the New Testament, it would be the same function referring to. If you read of an overseer in the New Testament, like we have read here in in this chapter 3 of of 1 Timothy, that would be the same function that the writer is referring to. So what should be the primary motivation to aspire for this function in the local church? Paul says there should be a desire for it. Aspiring to be a pastor or an elder or an overseer in a local church should come from a deep desire for this noble task. That word desire in Greek expresses a strong inner desire. There needs to be an inner God-given desire in a man's heart for this noble task. Psalm 36 verse 4 tells us that God gives us the desires of our hearts. This is one of them. This is a very specific desire that God gives to a man in his heart. To be an overseer or elder or pastor in his household. God is the giver of that desire. Of that proper God glorifying desire. Paul tells us. Just in the verse that we've read in in Acts 20 verse 28, he tells us that it's the Holy Spirit who made them overseers. This is the Holy Spirit who gives you that desire. And if the Lord has given you that, I remember my son when he was, Yurik, if you remember him, um, he was for a while in Israel um, studying to be a paramedic there. It is there that, that for the first time he called me and said, Dad, Wonderful. A lot of adrenaline when you have to deal with people in an accident. But you know what? I am testifying more about my faith than ever. I want to do it on a permanent basis. I have this desire to bring the word of God to people. And it's, and it's, how do I know? How do I know if that's what the Lord wants? I told him, if the Lord has put that desire in your heart, it will just grow stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger to the point where you say, Lord, where do you want to send me? Where, where should I start to work in your kingdom in this special function? It is a desire given by God. That's the first thing that should be there and it should be evident 
in such a man's life in the local church. The rest of the flock should observe it, see this desire in him coming to church, learning about God, coming to Bible studies, serving in certain ministries. This man will just not get enough of God's word and he would come to a point where he would ask the pastor, can I do some of the Bible studies? Can I do some of the ministries like teaching in YP or teaching in Sunday school? It starts with an inner desire that the Holy Spirit gives for a man to function in this noble task. Those are the two words Paul used at the end of verse 1. He calls the function of the overseer a noble task. I have to go back to the Greek. In the Greek, it means a good work. Noble task, in Greek, if I translate it directly, it means good work. An overseer is a good work. Now, what qualifies as good works? Good works are deeds done for Christ. When you go and read Matthew 25, where Jesus is telling that story um, of, of Judgment Day, where, they would, where the sheep and the goat would be um, separated, and the sheep, you call them the righteous, would ask, Lord, but, but why... Um, where have we seen you hungry? And where have we seen you in jail? And where have we seen you with all these needs? Um, and Jesus asked him, I told them, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, and here comes the qualification, you did for me. You did for me. A good work qualifies as a good work if it's done for Christ and his kingdom. And an overseer is such a good work. That's why Paul calls it a noble task. The work of an overseer is a good work because it is a work done for Christ. So the first qualification that we have to understand and that should be evident in an aspiring overseer, elder, or pastor, is this inner conviction that just gets louder and louder in that person's life of wanting, aspiring to serve in God's local church as an overseer, elder, or pastor. But that's not all. That deals with the first Qualification, which is the most important one. Verses 2 and 3, that's where we're going to stop today because the rest we will do next Sunday. Verses 2 and 3 deals with the overseer's moral character. What will you look for in the morality-wise in the character of an overseer? Now, there are quite a few. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to touch on nine of them. I, I can't remember if I ever had a sermon with nine points. I see Josie's eyes getting bigger and bigger. Don't fear. <laughs> I, I, will, I will give short references and um, focus on the ones that, that are really important. But what you need to see there in verses 2 and 3 is that Paul is not giving a CV for an overseer. The qualifications Paul mentions there are 99% personality characteristics. They are much more about who such a man is to be. And not about at what great academic institution he studied or how many degrees he has or how active and effective his social media profile is and presence is. No, it should not be about how many hits he gets on Instagram, but it should be about the Holy Spirit's indwelling and making. And with him indwelling such a man, him giving the desire for this man, there will be definitely observable characteristics in that man's life, which we generally would call the fruit of the Spirit. But Paul goes into a bit more detail, practical detail, detail here. What should be the overseer's moral character? Firstly, Paul says in verse 2, the overseer is to be above reproach. It doesn't mean perfect. 
It's just that nobody should be able to point a finger to him. Daniel is a good example. Please go with me to Daniel 6. Daniel 6, we should, re- we should read it for ourselves. Daniel 6, and I'm going to read from verse 3. This is the kind of above reproach that uh, we have in mind when we think of it. Daniel 6, verse 3. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor even negligent. Can you believe that? Finally, these men said, well, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. An overseer, a pastor, should be above reproach. No legitimate charge should be brought against an aspiring overseer or pastor. Not from within the church and not even from without. Not with regards to his personality, his conduct, his family. Not even with regards to his relationship with unbelievers. He should be above reproach. Nobody should be able to point a finger to him and say, yeah, you see, that man did that and that and that and that. But above all, he should be above reproach in his relationship with his wife. Verse 2. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. Normally, in the case of the New Testament, when you have a a certain action or a certain person whose name or action is written first down, it is to indicate that this is important. An overseer must be faithful to his wife. A pastor should be the husband of one wife. That's what literally what we have there from the Greek. The husband of one wife. Now this does not mean or prohibit bachelors from serving in as elders. It will be good if he's married. Remember that Paul was single. And he commended singleness um, for greater service in the kingdom of God. But that's not the emphasis here. The emphasis here is on faithfulness. He should be the husband of one wife, and that's it. A church wants to know if an overseer will be faithful to them, committed to them, have a covenant love for them for the long run. Now, where will you find an indication of this kind of faithfulness in an aspiring overseer? Or a pastor. And you might be in that situation where you might go to another church and the church has to call another pastor. What will you look for? Where will you find an indication of this faithfulness? In his marriage. In his marriage, you want to see one man, one woman in a love covenant for life. You don't want a fly by night to bring you God's word and take care of your souls. You want to see a relationship of faithfulness between husband and wife. You want to see exclusive dedication for one another. Because if it's there between husband and wife, it will be, it will be there between you and the pastor. Paul probably has in mind a candidate, a candidate showing signs of the sacrificial and unwavering love for his wife that we find in Christ who loves his bride. But aren't these the characteristics you want to see in a pastor of God's household? Wouldn't you gladly submit to such a man's oversight and teaching of God's truths? If you want to learn something of a pastor's commitment to you as a church and his faithfulness in bringing God's word and his truth and looking out and for you, his sacrifices that he are willing to make for you, his dedication to you, My dear brother and sister, sister, look no further than his relationship with his wife. Look at how he treats his wife. 
and you will have a good indication of how he will treat you. Look at how she responds to him when they are together in public. And you will have a good idea of the kind of expectations that there are in that relationship. Listen to how he speaks to her. Does he talk down to her? Does he belittle her in public? Does he, does he want a militant obedience? Is he harsh with her in public or in front of other people? I've actually made a note here in which I said, in which I wrote, if ever there comes a point where you have to decide on a pastor for a local church, get him and his wife there for the interviews, to observe in their relationship for a period of time. This is one of the important points, and I believe that's why Paul gave it to us right in the beginning. He should be above reproach with regards to his faithfulness to his wife. Thirdly, an overseer must be temperate. From the Greek, it means sober-minded and vigilant. Now, the word sober-minded describes a person um, who walks late at night in the city, he's alert. Things can go wrong. He's not paranoid, but he's alert. He's, he's watching out for danger. And that is absolutely necessary for the protection of the local church, of God's household. You want a vigilant overseer who notices the spiritual needs and warns of spiritual dangers. You, an overseer must not run after every new program and fad but sober-mindedly evaluate situations and decide on the most wise direction to take. He must also be self-controlled. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Now, self-controlled has got to do, in the original Greek, with decision-making. It means to be sensible. He must not make rash and impulsive decisions. You don't want a, an overseer to run after everything that comes on the market or the latest trends. And, and these things might be far from good for the health of the local church. You want someone who's sensible and think about um, decisions and think about the consequences and make a wise conclusion. That brings us to another aspect of self-control that we need to take in consideration when we are looking at an overseer, an elder, or a pastor. It means that he must have the ability to control his appetites, to control his impulses and responses. A good example is King David. Believe it or not, King David had sinned grievously against Bathsheba and her husband Uriah, Ultimately against God. But ironically, he became a good example of self-control. Amidst the misery and the rebellion that followed his sin and repentance. His remarkable self-control occurred during Absalom's rebellion. When David had to flee from Jerusalem. And one of Saul's descendants, Shimei, followed alongside David as David was fleeing from Jerusalem, pelting him with stones and tossing dirt on him as he shouted curses on David. What did David do? Did he tell his soldiers, off with his head, off with his head kill him? No, he didn't. There's an amazing self-control that we observe here. David saw that Shimei's cursings were not unexpected for the situation, and left vengeance to God. Self-control is a sign of trusting God for the situation. It shows that God is in control. And you don't want somebody who's out of control, cannot control his impulses and appetites to be the one looking after your soul. We want an overseer who waits upon the Lord rather than impulsively taking matters into his own hands. Then he needs to be respectable. Respectable, respectable, respectable refers to behavior that corresponds with inner self-control. The ancient viewed inner control as a strength, the strength of life, and 
outer balance, what you observe from the outside as the beauty of life. A beauty that should evoke admiration and respect. It refers to the reaction to the behavior of an inner self-discipline and order and balance that is observable to those people standing on the outside of his life and have respect as a result. So for example, because of this inner self-control, um, there will be an outward self-discipline working in his office, preparing. Uh, 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 there will be a sign of order in his life, balance of things. An overseer or pastor should not be constantly late for meetings, for example, or not follow up on promises. Such men suffer from ill self-discipline. A pastor should not change the church program every now and then constantly or lack a well-thought-through preaching schedule. Then there's the lack of order. An overseer must not make contradictory decisions. Say one for two, yes to one person for the same thing and no to the other person for the other. Then it's out of balance. In the end, this, this kind of reactions, uh, these kind of um, Ill, ills will lead to disrespect instead of respect. And pastors should be respectable. People should see his inner control in his outward self-discipline, order and balance, and respect him for that. A pastor should also not be given to drunkenness. Literally, it means not linger beside wine. You don't want to find him in a bar sitting there from 7 to 10 or 11. Drunkenness was an ancient blight in Corinth. Some Christians were even in the habit of getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. And Paul had to address that, 1 Corinthians 11. And you know what? We live in a culture that romanticizes drinking, specifically drinking alcohol. It is as if a soccer or a rugby match is now synonymous with, with clubbing and drinking. It is as if we cannot bribe without a glass of wine in our hands anymore. Dear family of God, your overseers, your elders, your pastors should be controlled by the spirit and not by wine. We should be, what should be visible in their lives should be the controlling effects of the Holy Spirit and not the indulgence in earthly pleasures of which wine is just one example. You must also be not violent, but gentle. Now, the, the Greek translated not violent, if we translate the Greek directly, it reads not a giver of blows. And you, you have a boxer in mind. He gives blows. A pastor should not be that. Now, I, we, we don't mean physically. I, I know stories where it happened, but th that's, that's the exception. But what is meant here is a metaphoric reference. It, it's a, a, a metaphorical reference to pugnaciousness. If you want to know what that means, I had to look it up myself. It means looking for fights all the time. A pastor or elder or overseer should not look for fights all the time. He should not be a bully, in other words. Such a man is not eligible for overseeing God's household. Men who are verbally, verbally or physically abusive cannot be trusted to lovingly tend God's flock. God's household cannot afford to be led by those who allow themselves to be controlled by intoxicating substances like wine, as we've just read earlier on, but also not by uncontrolled emotions like hot tempers. Instead, an overseer, an elder or pastor should be gentle. That's another fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Gentleness is the exact, exact opposite of being violent. Of course, an elder must be firm when he rebukes sin. That's not what we are saying. But what a flock want, do not want to see is a shepherd who is violent in character. Even by the way he, he speaks to people. Not raising his voice against them when they differ. 
from him. Not shouting at them when they think when he thinks there's a misunderstanding of a certain doctrine. Not talking down to them when they voice a false teaching or talk over them without listening to them. These are signs of a probably of an arrogant heart given to verbal violence. A pastor should not be violent but gentle. He also must not be quarrelsome. So these two are closely linked. To be quarrelsome betrays an inability to get along with others. An inability to respect and accept the views of others. And just constantly be against them. Now the false teachers in Ephesus were known for their quarrels. You can read of that in chapter 1 verse 5, chapter 6 verse 4 and 5. There were constant quarrels in in Ephesus. It, It affected their worship, it affected their prayer life, and it affected the order of the church. Now a leader prone to this weakness will produce discord and distrust instead of harmony in the leadership but also eventually in God's household. So an elder must be receptive and sensitive to the convictions and feelings and interests of others. And the church must not overlook this qualification. If we do, we will make it difficult, if not impossible, for overseers to work together. Lastly, an overseer must not be a lover of money. Overseers cannot love money and love God. Jesus said, you will always choose the one over the other. For the overseer or the pastor, it should be love for God that trumps everything in his life. If money pops up first, It means his claim for loving God is very, very weak. A church should want a pastor who loves God above all. Then they will know that he will love them truly. They should seek for a pastor who seeks the kingdom of God first and not the kingdom of this world. So how shall we sum up in one sentence maybe what we should see and look for in a pastor or elder or overseer. Now Paul does not give us that that summary in in this passage that we've read, but Peter does. When Peter wrote about the same qualifications or characteristics of, of elders or pastors in the local church, he ends with this sentence. You can read of that in 1 Peter 5 verse 3. 1 Peter 5 verse 3, that they should be examples to the flock. Examples to the flock. Examples in Christianity, but an example of Christ. A pastor should be an example of Christ's life, uh, love. Where do we find that in Christ? He gave up, up his life for his sheep. A pastor should be willing to give up things like time and and even health for the sake of the flock and for the sake of loving the flock. Uh, uh, An example of Christ in the the sense of of his sacrifice. How did Christ sacrifice? He laid down his glory in heaven to come to earth to be a human being and he paid for the sins of those who hated him. A pastor should be willing to sacrifice like Christ sacrificed for the congregation, for the flock, giving up luxuries for their sake, for their spiritual health. Christ is the example of humility. He was not violent. He was gentle. He was quiet like a lamb led to the slaughter. He put others' needs always before himself. And I'm referring to the salvation of sinners. Isn't that what a pastor then should do? Is to put the needs of those who serve God in his local household hold before himself. Jesus submitted to his father's will. Let your will be done, he said in the garden of Gethsemane. He was obedient to his father's will to the death. We want to see a pastor who is obedient to God, who will stand up for God, God's will, God's ways, God's laws. He should not only preach it, we will want to see it in the way that he um, conducts his life, conducts the ministry, preaches, counsels. 
Christ was, was, an, was an example of being above reproach. No charge could be laid against him. We've read that as one of the qualifications or characteristics that Paul gave us here. Christ was an example of the, or is the example of the perfect husband who laid down his life for his bride out of love. Christ is an example of temperateness. He saw right through the falseness of the Pharisees and he confronted them. Christ was the example of self-control. He could have called a million of, millions of angels to rescue him from that cross. He didn't because he loved those he came to serve to the extent and to the end that he gave his life for their sins. Christ was an example of gentleness. Look how caringly he treated and ate with and taught tough, hard-hearted sinners. In fact, he healed them. And Christ was an example of a lover of God, his Father, who cleared the temple from the lovers of money. A pastor must be an example of Christ to his flock. These are great shoes to fill on a human level. But at least you, the church, must make sure that your pastor wears those, wear those, wears those shoes when he counsels you, that he stands in them when he preaches the gospel, and that he walks in them when he acts and makes decisions in God's household. Above all, a pastor must be an example of Christ. The words of Paul ring in my ears on this note. I was talking to all Christians, but for a pastor it's so much more true. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now that goes for every Christian, but so much more for the pastor who stands here in the shoes of Christ to bring you his gospel, to counsel you, to take care of your soul, to desire that, is a noble task. Help your pastor with that. Pray for your pastor for that. Pastors, in our case, pastors, Pastor Kali and me, pray for us. And hold us to this. Our hearts are not perfect. We are not perfect. Not yet. One day we will be when we are, in the, when we are with Christ. But this is what we aspire for. To be examples to the flock. The example of Christ. One of the things that we've heard about Christ just now of being a, an example if the pastor follow in his footsteps is his love and his sacrifice of which we have a physical reminder here this morning which is the the grape juice and the bread, symbolizing his body that was broken for us and symbolizing his blood, his life that he gave for us. Now before we are going to um, take part in this communion, I would like us to sing a song. It's called Communion song, and I would like the, the uh, musicians to come forward, please. Um, if you can show us the words, there, Andrew. Mm -hmm. 